Hey everybody, today we're starting Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And I'll be honest, I've always found this to be a tough book to really enjoy. Uh, the series has been getting steadily darker and more complex. But this is the book in which everyone's in pain and no one's really able to help anyone else very much because there's really no one who's okay. And that's, that's hard to read. So while I know this is already my, fe my theme for the first book, I don't think we can avoid talking about trauma in these first eight chapters, because it's everywhere. If book one showed us Hogwarts as a microcosm of the trauma and danger inherent to the magical world, this book is showing us what that looks like on a societal scale, and how that trauma has resulted not just from unavoidable magical dangers like apparition accidents or falls from broomsticks, but from violence and war. So let's start in the obvious place. A lot of people read Harry as really annoying in this book. He's caps lock Harry, teenage Harry, hormonal Harry. And in these opening chapters, he's definitely shouting a lot and being mean to pretty much everyone. But before we start reading Harry as just an angry, moody teenager who needs to bring it down to a seven, I want us to consider that he has been recently traumatized, has received no mental health care, and is spending the summer in a toxic environment that triggers memories of childhood neglect and abuse. Harry's feeling trapped. A month after being bound to a headstone, he's back in the childhood home in which he was frequently locked in a cupboard, and he's being told he has to stay inside. Eventually, Vernon locks him in his bedroom, and Harry paces and lies in bed for three days. Harry's also cut off from his community and kept in the dark. He's in the house to which Dumbledore abandoned him for 10 years, and in which no one told him who he was. Now he's getting letters from his friends who are together without him, and the letters have no information. Harry has no one to talk to about the magical world. The Dursleys don't know anything about the specific trauma he's just experienced, and they don't want to hear anything about magic. Everyone who loves and appreciates and affirms Harry is far away. And we've seen in previous books how easy it is for him to lose his confidence that he's loved when he's subjected to the daily barrage of insults to the Dursleys. He's just had his hard-won trust shattered by Barty Crouch Jr., who spent the last year manipulating everyone around Harry, and now he doesn't trust anyone or believe that anyone understands him. Harry's also feeling useless. He feels like he's being treated like a child, and people don't remember or acknowledge all the grown-up things he's had to face. Meanwhile, the, ma the wider magical world doesn't believe him about Voldemort, and Dumbledore's given Harry no task to be part of the effort to defeat him. Not even something basic like, hey, you should take up running so you're in good shape to fight next time, or read these books so you can understand the history of what happened last time. Like, just, just give him something to do, Dumbledore. And underlying all of this, Harry is reliving the trauma of Cedric's death, Voldemort's rising, and his own battle in the graveyard. He's having nightmares, seeing flashes of the scene play over and over. He feels guilt about Cedric's death, and shame and anger about Voldemort using him to rise again. In keeping with every other trauma we've seen in this series, no one has any plan for helping Harry with what he's experienced. Instead, he's just left on his own in a hostile environment to relive his memories and stew in his feelings for a month, at the end of which he's attacked by Dementors, which are basically trauma-triggering horror shows that play for Harry his parents' dying screams. I know that Dumbledore's got a lot of irons in the fire right now, but this is not a great way to ensure the continued mental stability of the hero he hopes to have defeat Voldemort, let alone a 15-year-old child in his care. But it's not surprising, because as I said, just about everyone in these pages is traumatized. The adults, the other kids, even Creature the House Elf. And despite the love that most of them have for Harry, no one has the time or emotional bandwidth to give him the care that he needs. Take Sirius, for example. Last book, Sirius got to be independent and protective and resourceful, and he was a surprisingly good parental figure. But now, like Harry, he's confined to his childhood home, where he grew up unhappy and rejected by his family. Even though his mother is dead, she's still bad-mouthing him from her portrait. And the physical space of the house, with its troves of basically the magical world equivalent of Nazi memorabilia, is a reminder of every hateful thing his, his family stood for. Everything Sirius himself was both accused of by the Ministry and condemned by his family for not upholding. 
he too feels trapped and useless, wondering if Harry's okay but unable to go see him, all of which also no doubt triggers memories of his decade of confinement, grief, and psychological torture at Azkaban. When Harry does arrive at Grimmauld Place, there are things that Sirius could do, like focus on building his relationship with Harry while he's there, but he's already too depressed and reduced to teenage behaviors that put him on Harry's level rather than that of a parental figure. And furthermore, it seems likely that the combination of being stuck in his childhood home, Harry's appearance being so much like his father's, and the events of the last few years are all bringing up for serious memories of James and the guilt that he feels about his death. And really, you could pick any other order member of the order. There's Moody. Moody is one month free from a year imprisoned and starved in his trunk, which is only the most recent trauma he's endured. He was already kind of paranoid, and now he's even more so. And the others tease him about this, but he was right. Or Molly and Arthur. They weren't members of the Order in the last Wizarding War, but during Voldemort's decade-long reign of terror, they certainly must have known people who were tortured or killed. And just a few years ago, they almost lost Ginny to Voldemort at Hogwarts, the safest place in the world, when Voldemort hadn't even returned yet. How can they ever relax and feel that their children are safe again? When Molly came to cheer Harry on at the Triwizard Tournament, they had this lovely afternoon at Hogwarts, but I'm sure she was thinking about how the last time she was there, she'd come to collect the body of her 12-year-old child. And look how the tournament ended, with the death of another child. Molly's anxiety is not some kind of hysterical feminine coddling, as our narrator Harry seems to suggest. She knows what happens when Voldemort's in power, and she's done the math. She knows that a lot of the people that she loves are probably going to die. So this is the group that's planning the resistance. Every one of them carries the individual and collective trauma of the last war. To go back to our World War II allegory, this is England in the late 1930s. Everyone's still a mess from World War I. Even the children born after the war have been raised by survivors with their own scars and traumas, and no one wants to face another war. Except that Rowling shortened the timeline. Instead of 20 years, it's been 14. And we don't see those 10 years that Harry spent at the Dursleys. What was everyone in the magical world doing? We know there were trials for the Death Eaters, but was there anything for the survivors? All the people who lost people, or who saw or were forced to do horrible things? Based on what we've seen of how Hogwarts handles trauma, probably not. And that's part of the tragedy of collective trauma, is no one has the bandwidth to help others because everyone is traumatized. And now everyone's being returned to these sites of trauma, the physical places where these things happened. The Dursley House is a place of trauma for Harry, just as number 12 Grimmauld Place is a place of trauma for Sirius. Harry's going to return to Hogwarts, just like Molly probably did, remembering what happened the last time he was there. The Quidditch pitch, where he's usually so happy and free, will be the place to which he returned with Cedric's body. The Great Hall, where his name came out of the Goblet of Fire, where Cedric danced with Cho at the Yule Ball, where Dumbledore announced Voldemort's return at the end of Year Feast. All of Hogwarts is going to remind Harry of what's happened in various ways. And we can think about what other places are or become reminders of trauma for Harry and other characters across the series. I'd argue that Fudge uses place as a trigger for trauma as a strategy at Harry's disciplinary hearing. Clearly he changes the place in an effort to make Harry and Dumbledore arrive late or miss the hearing, and he may also be using the dungeon courtroom to intimidate Harry. But also, this is a place of trauma for everyone on the Wizengamot. Arthur says they haven't used that courtroom in years, probably since the Death Eater trials. Fudge brings everyone there again, maybe to get them back in that very serious headspace of sending chained up mass killers to Azkaban, so as to color their attitude toward the defendant, whose comparatively minor crime was to launch a Patronus in the suburbs. I want to go back to the suburbs for a moment, because I don't think the Dursleys are exempt from the trauma that pervades these chapters. Again, I will preface this by saying that the Dursleys are perhaps the most recognizable monsters of this series. They're not theatrically raising themselves from the dead in the graveyard, but much like Fudge, who's a selfish and irresponsible politician, the Dursleys are the bad guys we can see in our own world, abusing and neglecting a child left in their care. So much of Harry's trauma is their fault. And even the way that Harry copes with this trauma, through anger and shouting, is what he's been subjected to all his life. 
And also, the Dursleys are traumatized. When Petunia gets the howler, Harry sees her really sad for the first time. She lost her sister. She never talks about her. Who would she talk to? Petunia becomes an awful monster toward Harry, and for the first time this book invites us to wonder why and how that might relate to her grief. And if she's protective of Dudley and blind to his faults, is that, in part, a result of having a sister who was murdered and knowing that violence can take the people she loves any time? Especially where there's magic involved. Has Petunia always hated Harry because she sees him as the reason Lily is dead? Does she fear him as a danger to Dudley? Dudley, too, is clearly traumatized. We saw this in the last book, when he covered his backside and kept close to the wall when the Weasleys arrived. Every encounter he's ever had with magic has been terrifying and physically dangerous. The pig's tail in the first book, Aunt Marge inflated in the third book, and candy that made his tongue so large he was suffocating in the last book. Dudley's a bully, but he understands that magic can destroy him, and he's one of the few muggles who bears the physical scars of it. When Harry pulls out his wand, Dudley responds exactly like he would to a gun. Four times he shouts, first, don't you point that thing at me. And he backs up into a wall as Harry puts it to his chest and he shouts again, point that thing somewhere else. Then point it somewhere else. And finally, all caps, get that thing away from. Dudley's cut off when he's attacked on the street by magic he can't even see. As usual, the chapters with the Dursleys come to us through Harry's perspective, which makes it even more difficult to empathize with them. But I come pretty close in these chapters even with Vernon. Vernon sees magic as abnormal, and this is presented as part of his general bigotry. He doesn't like abnormal things. But he also sees magic as destructive, which is not unreasonable. This is what he's witnessed. A magical madman murdered his sister-in-law and brother-in-law, and ever since his nephew discovered he's a wizard, that destruction has threatened Vernon's home and family. A year ago, he watched his son almost suffocate, and now his sons come home in a state of shock, having almost been killed again. Vernon's trauma at witnessing his child in life-threatening danger is no less genuine than the Weasleys with Jenny. It's a parent's worst nightmare. So it's not all that surprising to me that Vernon responds kind of like Harry's in a gang and some rival is coming for him, putting his family in the line of fire. Petunia overrules Vernon after the Howler, but I can kind of see why he'd have this instinctive response. This is not him wanting to preserve the boring normalcy of the suburbs. This is him wanting magic to stop endangering and traumatizing his partner and child. Unfortunately for Harry, there's no such possible escape from magic. We understand by this point that he can only keep going forward, a child soldier marching toward an inevitable battle. And everyone around him is doing the same, with all of their collective and individual trauma in tow. So it's going to get heavy, and it's going to be a lot of caps lock. But I hope we can be sensitive when we read Harry in this book. Yes, I want to hold him accountable for the decisions he makes and the way that he treats people. But I also want to remember that he's not just an angsty teen. He is traumatized, and that can look like a lot of different things.